we are going to talk today about four things. So we're going to talk about the implementation dip, and then I'm going to tell you two reasons why I think we are in an implementation dip in some of the places where I work. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some ideas for climbing out, some things that we're doing. And then I'm going to leave you with a personal challenge. So that's my goal in the next 18 minutes. So I want to talk about pizza. So in 1984, when David Rose and Grace Mayo and Skip Stahl and um, Ann Meyer, Linda Mensing, when they met in a pizza parlor in Massachusetts and they conceived this idea that would become UDL, they probably never thought that there would be a conference 35 years later just to talk about the implementation of that framework. We've had some awesome successes in those 35 years, but like anything in education, we also have experienced some dips in our work. And we're going to talk a little bit about that dip and maybe some reasons for that dip. And I also want to acknowledge that 35 years ago when UDL was conceived, there was no framework. There were no guidelines. That didn't exist. What was at the heart of the work around universal design for learning was this understanding and this desire to disrupt inequities that a group of educators saw happening for kids. And I'm saying that right now because that is really the core of this talk, and I want us to come back to the core of the why of why we do this work around universal design for learning. What's the why? And why are we trying to disrupt inequities that exist in education? And I also want to note that that wasn't popular at that time. We taught to the, to the norm. 20 years ago, when I first started teaching, somebody gave me a textbook. They were like, shoot to the average, and you'll catch everybody. Like, you know, it, it wasn't, we were pushing when we were trying to include kids who were in the margins. And then fast forward to 2017, um, David got the Lifetime Achievement Award. And my colleague, Jennifer Cates, where are you? Are you in here? She reminded me yesterday when we were talking. And my good friend, John Mundorf, who, who drove down last night, he said, uh, one of the things that Jennifer and I were saying was that David said that their goal in measuring UDL was really to think about the extent to which it was disrupting inequities. So think about that. That's one of his like final wrap-ups with this work, measuring it to the extent with which you are disrupting. And there's a difference between the UDL guidelines and the UDL framework. They're two different things. And what I'm talking about right here is the framework, the belief set, the philosophy of teaching and learning that is universal design. And then something else that, that he said that I think we all need to really sit with and think about, and I'm laughing at this image because Allison and Mindy were hosting this little webinar that David did, and he, this was his retirement t-shirt. He had on like a white t-shirt, and it was his farewell thing. But in that speech, he, or in that talk, he said to us, I recognize that a degree from Harvard University gave me some pretty dramatic privilege. And in that privilege, I needed to remember that I was giving voice to those students who've been marginalized. So I'm saying that to all of us right now because we're at a time in the field where we need to have some really courageous conversations about the work that we're doing. And we need to look at each other and we need to think about the, the privilege that we sit in and the responsibility that we have to lend our voice to our students who are not experiencing positive outcomes and to really push and ask the hard questions. So from here on out, the next 14 and a half minutes, I want to try to keep this as personal, local, and immediate as I can. And I'm going to use the tools that I've been taught to have tough conversations. Because I do think in our field, if we want to move forward, we need to have hard conversations and we need to push ourselves to talk about things that we don't often feel comfortable talking about. So if you haven't experienced this book, I highly recommend it, Courageous Conversations About Race by Glenn Singleton. I also recommend that you grab a copy of Patty and Louie's Culturally Responsive Teaching in UDL, pick up Troublemakers by Carla Shalaby, read Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain by Zaretta Hammonds, follow Val Brown and Clear the Air on Twitter, and UDL and Social Justice, the All Y'all movement that John Mundorf helps to run. That needs to be part of our work around universal design for learning. We need to add those things to our toolkit if we're really going to reach the kids 
that are still experiencing negative outcomes. So some of the things that we're gonna talk about in this work are gonna make us uncomfortable, but that's where the growth occurs. Because we need to recognize the things we've done well, and we need to recognize the things that we haven't done so well. Like what's not working? What do we need to do better? And a lot of that work starts with us. That's the personal work that I wanna talk about today that's led us to be in this implementation dip. So why do I think we end up in a dip? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm just gonna pick two. I'm gonna pick two that relate to this undercurrent of disrupting inequity. So I believe that we need to take our work around UDL back to our why. So when you got into this work, why did you start applying UDL to your classrooms and to your districts? And if you're like many of us that I talk to daily in the UDL field, at the heart of our work around universal design for learning is inequity in ability and disability, in gender, in race, in ethnicity. Like we are recognizing that there are certain kids that don't have good outcomes and good experiences. And that's why we got to UDL. We said we need to find a framework that recognizes that the only thing that's normal is variability, and we need to push on that, and we need to call that out in our design. And that's the heart of why we do these things. So that, to me, that understanding that inequities are the heart of why UDL, it's not just about UDL, right? It's about, it's really about disrupting inequity. That's what it's about. UDL is our, our bus that's gonna help us get there. But in doing that, sometimes when we dig into this work, and I work with districts that have done this, my own district has done this, I have done this, we sometimes get really technical about something that was never designed to be technical. It was designed to be adaptive. And an adaptive challenge is really hard to, to deal with. It's hard to measure. It requires really hard conversations. It requires a lot of thinking and a lot of talking. But what happens sometimes is we fail when we're leading this work because we make something that was designed to be adaptive very technical. So my challenge is if we're truly dealing with inequity, I want to think about the conversations that need to happen, the conceptual change that needs to happen. That's all part of it. Yes, we need to, to measure UDL, but we can't turn it into a checklist. So this is the old uh, checklist that still kind of floats around. That was never meant to be technical. That was like a learning tool. But in some places where I visit, and in some classrooms even in my own district, we want to check off the boxes with UDL. And it's not about either or, or this is UDL and this isn't. That's not what it's about. It's about this recognition that we are trying to solve really tough problems. So we've got to hold ourselves to not making this technical. And I'm putting that on all of us, myself included. The other reason why I think we experience an implementation dip sometimes is because we get loose with our language. I love the term learner variability. That's my favorite thing about UDL. But I need to be really clear about what I mean when I say learner variability. So two things that we often kind of equate with that. We say all means all, right? We even hashtag all means all. And that's true when I'm talking about all and I'm talking about variability, I'm talking about every kid in my class. But that is not synonymous with everybody getting the same thing. All means all can sometimes mean the same thing as equality. And if we're really digging into this work, we don't mean that everybody gets the same thing. We mean that everybody gets what they need, and that means that some kids get different things than others. And when somebody says to you, you're employing UDL, isn't that giving certain kids a leg up? I want you to look at them with that face, like the, wait, what? What are you talking about? And ask more about why they said that. Dig into why they're not doing this with you and try to figure out what's at the root of that. When we say level the playing field, UDL lets us level the playing field, I want you to have the second conversation. Is the playing field level for everybody even when you do think you're leveling in your classroom? What are people coming to you with? What's the context in which your students come to your classroom? We need to ask that because it is not the same for everybody. So my second reason for the dip is that I think we get a little too loose with our language and we need to tighten it up. And we need to ask those questions and make sure that when we are employing our different options and planning our flexible learning environments, we are not doing it under this umbrella that learner variability, we're not seeing gender, we're not seeing race, we're not seeing these, these different ways that we qualify kids. We do need to see those things. We have to see all of them because it matters. Context matters and that's part of variability. So the, the, the image that I see all the time, you've seen it before, right? We have um, the, I don't even know where to point. So this is equality and this is supposed to be equity, right? So we've seen that. 
Um, but then my, my challenge here is now what, what the issue is actually in the kids in this picture. It's the height. And that's not what UDL is about. It's not about problematizing kids. It's about problematizing the environment. What's wrong in the environment? And so in this image, we're actually trying to get rid of the barriers that are in the environment. But I still think that's not enough. We need to see the context in which these kids are coming, even to the space where we've removed the barriers. That's just as important. So my challenge for you is what's next? Like what's in that next box? And there's actually a really cool website called like the fourth space or something where you can design the fourth picture. So Check that out, it's kind of cool. All right, so now these are two reasons why I think in my district we've gotten into a little bit of a dip. And I want to tell you personally, locally, immediately, how we in Baltimore, Maryland, are thinking about climbing out. And the way that we're doing that, um, we're going to expand upon it in another session at 11.15. So if you want to hear more, you can come see Jill and Nikki and I talk about that later. But I'm going to take you back to the 80s again. So what were you doing in 1986? What did your school look like in 1986? What did the demographics look like in 1986? So this is what I was doing in 1986. Uh-huh. Yep. The bright colors were even, happened even then. Really liked my, I like Cindy Lauper, I like Debbie Gibson, I like Janet Jackson, I like Whitney Houston, I like Stevie Nicks. Haven't totally grown out of those things. But this was where I went to school. I went to school in Baltimore, where I live and work now. And this was our enrollment data. So 1986 enrollment data, and this is our 2018 enrollment data. So why am I showing you this data in this talk around the implementation dip? I'm showing it to you because the data suggests that we need to make changes in the way that we design our instruction to meet the very different needs of the kids that are in our classroom. What hasn't changed in this time is our teaching force. Our teaching force looks pretty much the same. But what we know is that we need to attend to the variability that exists in our classrooms. That is a major must. So, question for you here. What is, has anybody ever seen this before? This is, um, if you've read anything from, from Ron Heifetz, so this is, this is kind of um, the, the visual of the technical and adaptive solutions, okay? And what we're doing in our district is we are trying to recognize when we're being technical about things and when we're being adaptive because we're realizing that we need to be in this space right here in order to get people to have the conversations that we need to have about the data and our students. So what have we done to have this conversation? And I'm going to come back to this graphic in a minute. But in 2013, Maryland was the first state in the nation to have legislation around universal design for learning, which is pretty awesome. Very proud of that. In 2014, our district put in a policy around equity in our school district. So we are actually calling out that equity is providing each student with what is necessary to achieve high academic outcomes. That's first for us. So yes, we have legislation, legislation around UDL, which helps us figure out what it looks like, how we're addressing our changing demographic and the needs of our students that are different. But this policy around equity is core to our work. And every time we meet in our teams, every time we look at data, we are challenged to come back to that. So what does it look like? What does UDL in a state that has UDL in their code look like? What does it look like in a district that their zero level policy is on equity? This is a screenshot from our website about what you should expect to see in our classrooms. So in the interest of time, I highlighted a couple of things that I want to read to you and I want you to tell me what it sounds like. And as, you, as I do that, I want you to think about the reason we're employing these different teaching techniques is to dismantle some of the structures that have existed, that one-size-fits-all, very traditional way of teaching that continues to marginalize some of our kids. So these are some things that we do. Whole class, small class, some kids are moving ahead, some kids are working on additional, looking at things in a different way, in a different format. Every student is getting what they need. We have a device for every student, so we have flexibility. Our content is multimedia. We have face-to-face, -face. we have small group, flexible learning environments. We want our students to become expert learners. Our goals are set and our means are flexible. Students have opportunities to choose how they learn. Choices motivate students. Teachers are in and out of their classrooms. What does that sound like without saying it? That is language from UDL. Flexible learning environments, expert learning, multiple means. We really believe in a learner-centered, student-centered environment 
in order to address the demographic that we have in our schools. We needed to shift the way that we teach in order to prevent outcomes that are not good for all of our kids. We see UDL as a way to uproot inequity. So that is great, and we are really proud of that. But here's where the courageous conversations come in. And we've got principals who are doing this work every day, and it is hard work, and it makes people uncomfortable, but it makes us move. So this is data from one of our schools. I just got to work with this principal, and she is digging into this work really deeply in her school. They have great data. 83% of their kids last winter were, if you look at the last row, it says achievement data, percent of students above 50%. That's good. That's good data. They have great things going on in that building, really awesome things. But when they dig deeper into their data, they see that their white students are outperforming their black students in a big way. That's a massive gap. And look at their Hispanic students. This is district-wide. This is a pattern that cuts across different places in our district. And that's not OK. So while we are celebrating our equity policy and the fact that we've shifted instruction, when we dig even deeper into the data, and this is over-representation and under-representation in Algebra 1, which is a gateway. That is a gateway class. Kids should have access to that class. So yes, we are doing UDL, and we are proud of our learner-centered environments, but we have to talk about this data, because that is not good, and that is not OK. So how are we doing that? How are we doing that? And that relates to the personal challenge that I want to throw at all of you. When you're having conversations around UDL and things are looking good, I want you to dig even deeper into that data and make sure it's looking good for everybody. I want you to disaggregate that data and see if there are certain populations that still need that extra push and that need things to happen for them differently. That's our responsibility. And that's where your personal challenge comes. And I'm going back to this graph. This piece right here, this is when we get really technical about things. So for example, we see the UDL guidelines. It's really good. I do some strategies. And it works really well for this class. Then I get a whole new group of learners this year, next year. And I'm down here. This line right here, these are the people that see the framework. And they're like, oh, this is too much for me. I'm just not going to do it. These are also the people that don't want to have the conversation about the kids who are in the margins. They're going to step away from you when you try to push and have that courageous conversation. You want to find the people that want to get messy with you. You want to find the people that want to get into that squiggly line and talk about what hasn't been working and look at themselves and see what things they've done that may or may not have worked. And you also, your other challenge is if you are employing any of these guidelines, I want you to make sure you're going back to the roots and you're exploring it with the foundation of disrupting inequities. Because that is how it started and that's the conversation that we need to continue to push as we get even further into the weeds and the technicality of the work. And then here's my next challenge for you. UDL should push against the dominant norm. And for my friends that are from places outside of the US, these are some nasty things that show up in US education culture. And maybe they show up and challenge you to think about it. But think about those pieces. And if they show up, you know, we know in education in the US that stuff is happening. And we can predict that it's going to be there. So plan for it in advance and then do something about it. And who are the people that are going to do something about it? It's every single person in this room. And here is one, the last thing that David said in his letter to us two years ago when he retired from CAST. He said that the field of UDL is now happily populated by a powerful and inspiring group of new leaders, teachers, researchers, administrators, developers who are both eager and capable of guiding the next steps along the upward journey both in the USA and worldwide. These faces are your faces. These are the people that showed up on the very first page of the UDL IRN login when I got in this morning. It is on us to make this work happen, and it is on us to take the power and spread it out, because that's what he wanted us to do. So next year, when you come back, I want you to look around this room, and I want you to see who's here, and I want you to celebrate this group, but I also want you to see who's not here, what faces are not in this room, and what are you going to do with intentionality, and what other people are you going to engage, and what else do you still need to learn? Because whatever it is that you want to interrupt, it takes a lot of courage and intentionality to do that, and we need to keep learning. So thank you for being here, and thank you for taking the challenge.